Yeah, so I, I guess it's best to start with definitions. And so I've done a lot of research showing how price inflation uh, correlates uh, with increases in broad money supply, uh, although there are some exceptions. And so generally, uh, there's monetary inflation, which is just an increase in the broad money supply, especially on a per capita basis. Uh, then you have price inflation, which is basically the, the prices of things, usually commodities, but it trickles up to everything else, prices, wages, things like that going up. Uh, and then you have asset price inflation, where if you have a lot of money supply growth, but you manage to keep, uh, say, commodity inflation low, because maybe there's a lot of commodity abundance at that time, uh, then that can instead translate into asset price inflation, where we pay more for the same stock. Uh, basically, it, we, we're paying to pay more for the same stream of earnings in a stock than we otherwise would. And, and it basically, it can kind of, kind of cause bubbles in financial assets. Uh, and so, you know, we the last decade, we we're at the stage where uh, monetary inflation was moderate. Uh, it wasn't low, but it wasn't super high either. Uh, and because if you look at broad money supply rather than just base money. So a lot of people look at the base money charts and it just goes like parabolic, but broad money supply was was growing at kind of a moderately high pace. Uh, and because we were in a period of commodity uh, abundance, uh, you know, a lot of that increase translated into asset price inflation instead. Uh, but now as we go into the 2020s, money supply growth has, has accelerated in many parts of the world, especially developed markets who, who've had more kind of fiscal space uh, to, to do uh, some of the fiscal uh, activities they wanted to do, with the United States and Canada being among the, the highest in terms of, say, year-over-year -year percent change in broad money supply. Uh, and because our commodity markets are, are a little bit tighter than they were over the past decade, uh, and because of this, this how, how quickly M2 is rising, uh, we're starting to see bottlenecks in different sort of uh, supply chains or commodities. And so that translates more towards actual price increases where where commodities go up, uh, wages can go up, uh, and, and basically shipping costs can go up, all sorts of things can trickle through, and you find yourselves with these periodic shortages. Uh, and so generally what you see is that the, the past two inflationary decades of the past uh, century were the, the 1970s and the 1940s, uh, and if we go back further than that, we can find you know the, the World War One inflations. Like the United States had big inflation uh, in the in the in the you know the 1910s, and of course Germany had the big hyperinflation in the next decade. Uh, but if we just look at the past two ones, uh, the 70s were characterized by uh, rapid increases in the broad money supply and an oil shock, uh, so an oil embargo. And so that caused that combination of commodity scarcity with rapidly rising money. Uh, and then the 1940s, of course, you had uh, fiscal driven inflation uh, and uh, you had various commodity shortages related to the war. Uh, we even started making you know, pennies out of a different material because we needed the, the normal material for the war effort and things like that. Basically, all the little details you need to get all, all this, all the commodities you could. Uh, and so you know, what we find ourselves in the 2020s is that money supply is going up at the fastest rate that it's gone up since since World War II uh, in, in many countries, uh, with the United States and Canada kind of leading the way in terms of that that percent change, uh, while at the same time we're facing uh, semiconductor shortages, uh, shipping container shortages, uh, yeah, things like that. And that and be, of course because semiconductors are used in so many things, that trickles into to used car prices and, and, and all sorts of things like that. Uh, and so my overall base case in the 1940s, I mean, in the 2020s, is it looks somewhat like the 1940s in the sense that you have these periodic uh, uh, spikes of inflation based on fiscal expansion. So based on the, on fiscal driven money supply grow, going up, which means you're running large deficits to, to basically pump up the money supply, uh, which is different than say the 1970s, which is more, more so bank lending based. Uh, and so if you look at the 1940s, you had three really big inflationary spikes. Uh, and you could you could call them uh, transitory in the sense that it didn't keep it, it's not like uh, inflation kept just getting worse and worse and worse. It had these really big spikes and then it would calm down. However, it never it never like those prices never came back down. They just kind of went up and they had a new plateau and then they went up again and they had a new plateau. And I see the 2020s playing out similarly where you could have you know these periods of of inflation that reach some eye-popping numbers compared to what we've had in the past 10, 20 years. Uh, but then they cool over and some of those those bottlenecks get resolved. Uh, but then if they do another big round of fiscal uh, stimulus and kind of, you know, the next cycle, you can get another spike in inflation and that can cool off. But each time the prices in general are just kind of hitting new plateaus. And there's, you know, there, there will be some areas like say lumber that get really silly high and, and they'll come back down. Whereas if you look at like a broad set of prices, uh, you know, those will generally be elevated after each one of those those bursts of inflation.
Well, uh, it's a maybe a qu I mean, you already talked about the, inf the definition of inflation, but it seems to me that some institutions like central banks or other economists um, have, uh, uh, we witness uh, an inflation of theories of inflation. Oh yeah, they basically every nice idea of how it works. And so that's actually, you know, I wrote like a recent article because I wanted to uh, find correlations and find causes and, and, and kind of look through the history books and find out, you know, where it comes from. And basically it's one of those things There's that parable of like uh, three three different people are like blindfolded and they're touching like an elephant and they're all touching like a different part. Like someone's touching the tusk and someone's touching the ear and someone's touching like the skin and they're all describing something that sounds totally different, but it really they're just each describing a small part of, of you know, what it is. Uh, and so I think that's that's the biggest risk that, you know, economists or forecasters have is that they can be wrong without, you know, they're, they're, what they said might not be wrong. But it's just incomplete, uh, and so that's 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 always kind of the most challenging part of economic forecasts is that you know one or two missing variables can can change the direction, even if you know, like say the five variables you were looking at ended up being correct. Uh, and so I think it's really important to step back and try to have the biggest possible umbrella framework, uh, and, and then kind of monitor that going on, and then test it, like basically see if it's playing out the way you thought. Uh, and if it's not, then you quickly back back up and say, what what variable am I missing? Uh, what is deviating from what I thought, and how can I adjust uh, to compensate for that? Or if it is working, then it then that's a good feedback for the theory, and then you just got to keep monitoring to make sure things don't change. <laughs> so, if I take your analogy further, would you say that the ones that are basically the pilots and behind the wheel of all those institutions, like central banks and all also like governments through their fiscal uh, policies, are actually blindfolded behind the wheel? I think partially, yeah. I think they're, you know, they have some of the answers, but not all the answers. Uh, and so, if you look at their their meeting minutes, I mean, they're often, you know, kind of uh, figuring things out like anyone else is, uh, and and kind of just saying like, we don't know how it's going to play out, but here's our here's what we're thinking. Uh, and so, I, I think in, it's also one of those things where sometimes they know more than they let on because there are certain things you can't say kind of publicly that because it, it's, it's somewhat of a political role you know it's supposed to be independent there's still a political element to it uh and so kind of like how politicians uh don't necessarily say what they mean uh you have kind of a similar situation with, with central bankers where you know they they don't want to be the cause of things so they don't want to if they talk about high inflation that can be uh uh, uh self-fulfilling uh and so they always are kind of playing things down and kind of looking towards the the median uh, rather than kind of stoking up whatever uh, extremes that that the that things could go in they're always trying to kind of push back to that middle <laughs>